Hello everyone, welcome back to Adras EC Talks. As usual, we are continuing with the VHSA revision class. So today's topic is from American Literature, Module 9. So if you are watching my channel for the first time, please do share, subscribe and like my channel and also hit the bell icon to get more updates from my channel. So without wasting much time, let's move on to today's presentation. First topic is Out of the Cradle, Endlessly Rocking by Walt Whitman. So this poem is one of his most complex and successfully integrated poems. Whitman used several new techniques in the poem. One is the use of images like boy, bird, sea. The influence of music is also seen in opera form. Some critics have taken the poem to be an elegy mourning the death of some dear to him. The basic theme of the poem is the relationship between suffering and art. It shows how a boy matures in their poet through his experience of love and death. Art is a sublimation of frustrations and death is a release from the stress and strains caused by such frustrations. The poem features a young boy walking on the beach who finds two mockingbirds nesting and watches them. The female bird fails to appear one day and the male bird cries out for her. The bird's cries create an awakening in the boy who translates what the male is saying in the rest of the poem. As this happens, the boy recognizes the impact of nature on the human soul and its own consciousness. Originally titled A Child's Reminiscence, the poem was first published in the Saturday Press on December 24, 1859. The poem was later included in the 1860 edition of Leaves of Grass under the title A Word Out of the Sea and occasionally erroneously referred to even by Whitman himself as A Voice Out of the Sea. Out of the Cradle, Endlessly Rocking is found in the title session Sea Drift. Several of Whitman's poems, including Out of the Cradle, Endlessly Rocking, focus on the seashore. His first was a sketch. Next is I Felt a Funeral by Emily Dickinson. Emily Dickinson's I Felt a Funeral in My Brain, which was published in 1861, used an extended metaphor of death and funerals to convey the death of her sanity. Through the imagery of mourners and coffins, I Felt a Funeral in My Brain explores death, suffering and madness themes. It is a terrifying poem as the speaker explores the idea of what it would be feel like to be conscious after death. The vivid description of her sense of hearing allows the readers to picture themselves there in place of her experience their own deaths in full consciousness. Some literary critics have suggested that this poem is not a description of the speaker's own physical death, but rather a description of the death of some part of her that she was unable to retain. Next poem, Home Burial by Robert Frost. Home Burial was first published in 1940 and it is written in blank verse and mostly in dialogue. The poem centers on the peril and pain of miscommunication. The characters, a husband and wife who have recently buried their child, cope with grief very differently and can't understand or respect each other's mourning process. By the poem's conclusion, the, the title has taken on a double meaning referring not only to the grave of couple's dead son but also to the likely death of their love and their marriage. Next poem, Sunday Morning by Wallace Stephens. So this is a poem from his first book of poetry, Harmonium, which is published in part in the November 1950 issue of Poetry then in full in 1923 in Harmonium. It is now in the public domain. The first published version can be read at the poetry website. The literary critic Bjorn Winters considers Sunday Morning the greatest American poem of the 20th century and certainly one of the greatest contemplative poems in English. About this poem, Stevens wrote that it was simply an expression of paganism. Helen Medler in the Cambridge Companion to Wallace Stephen summarized the poem as Stephen searched for a systematic truth that could replace the Christianity of his church going childhood. The critic Robert Butel sees the poem as establishing the French painter Matsy as a kindred spirit to Stevens. 
in that both artists transform a pagan joy of life into highly civilized terms. The next poem is Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. The Raven is a narrative poem first published in January 1845. The poem is often noted for its musicality, stylized language and supernatural atmosphere. It tells of a distraught lover who is paid a mysterious visit by a talking raven. The lover, often identified as a student, is lamenting the loss of his love, Lenore. Sitting on a bust of palace, the raven seems to further antagonize the protagonist with its constant repetition of the word nevermore. The poem makes use of folk mythologies, religious and classical references. Poe claims to have written the poem logically and methodologically with the intention to create a poem that would appeal to both critical and popular taste as he explained in his 1846 follow-up essay, The Philosophy of Composition. The poem was inspired in part by a talking raven in the novel Barnaby Rudge, A Tale of the Riots of 80 by Charles Dickens. Poe based the complex rhythm and meter on Elizabeth Barrett's poem Lady Geraldine's courtship and made use of internal rhymes as well as alliteration throughout. The Raven was first attributed to Poe in print in the New York Evening Mirror on January 29, 1845. Its publication made Poe popular in his lifetime, although it did not bring him much financial success. The poem was soon reprinted, parodied and illustrated. Critical opinion is divided as to the poem's literary status, but it nevertheless remained one of the most famous poems ever written. The Raven follows an un unnamed narrator on a dreary night in December who sits reading forgotten lore by a dying fire as a way to forget the death of his beloved Lenore. Next is Phenomenal Woman by Maya Angelou. It's a poem that first appeared in Maya Angelou's third collection titled And Still I Rise, which was published in 1978. The poem features a speaker who, despite not being a thin as a society tells her she needs to be, nevertheless embodies, or embodies her femininity with an attraction, with an attractive self-confidence. The poem rejects narrow societal expectations of women and proposes an alternative perspective on what defines real beauty. Confidence and com comfort in one's own skin, the speaker insists, are the makers of true beauty. The Emperor Jones by Eugene O'Neill. The Emperor Jones is a 1920 tragic play by American dramatist Eugene O'Neill that tells the tale of Brutus Jones, a resourceful, self-assured African-American and a former Pullman porter who kills another black man in a dice game, is jailed and later escapes to a small backward Caribbean island where he sets himself up as emperor. The play recounts the story in flashbacks as Brutus makes his way through the jungle in an attempt to escape former subjects who have rebelled against him. Originally called The Silver Bullet, the play is one of O'Neill's major experimental works mis mixing expressionism and realism and the use of an unreliable narrator and multiple points of view. It was also an oblique commentary on the US occupation of Haiti after bloody rebellions there, an act of imperialism that was much contemned in O'Neill's radical political circle in New York. The Emperor Jones was O'Neill's first big box of his hit. It established him as a successful playwright after he won the Pulitzer Prize for Drama for his first play, the much less well-known Beyond the Horizon, which was published in 1920. The, the Emperor Jones was included in Burns Mantle's The Best Plays of 1920-21. The next work is The Glass Menagerie by Telly C. Williams. It is a memory play that, pre that was premiered in 1944 and catapulted Williams from obscurity to fame. The play has strong autobiographical elements featuring characters based on its author, his histrionic mother and his mentally fragile sister. In writing the play, Williams drew on an earlier short story as well as a screenplay he had written under the title The Gentleman Caller. 
The play premiered in Chicago in 1944. After a shaky start, it was championed by Chicago critics Ashton Stevens and Claudia Cassidy, whose enthusiasm helped build audience so the producers could move the play to Broadway, where it won the New York Drama Critics Circle Award in 1945. The Glass Managery was William's first successful play. He went on to become one of America's most highly rewarded playwrights. By this, here we come to the end of today's presentation. Hope you have liked today's video. Thank you.